This video will be a little different because I'm going to tell you a story. A story of a young woman who found her voice when she couldn't speak and how she used it to bring awareness and joy to millions. I want to tell you a story and to ask the question, what happened to Carly Fleischmann? Carly is a young woman on the autism spectrum diagnosed with a form of dyspraxia, making her effectively mute. And for the early years of her life, people thought she basically had nothing to say. That in fact, she couldn't speak at all. But at 10 years old, she was given a keyboard and people were wrong. She was able to type, slowly but surely. She's bubbly and funny, witty and sarcastic. Her father wrote a book about her journey called Carly's Voice. Eventually, she even started her own talk show called Speechless with Carly Fleischmann, where she interviewed famous people like Channing Tatum, Whitney Cummings, and James Van Der Beek. She is, in every sense of the word, an inspiration. Proof that people without a voice can speak if the world just let them. When I first heard about her six years ago, I was inspired. It defined my views on ableism and made me a more tolerant and understanding person. Which is why it pains me to have to say the following. Content warning. This video contains mention of sexual assault and abuse. Before I get started, I want everyone who watched this to understand some simple instructions. Do not harass anyone I mentioned in this video, and I implore you to watch until the very end to have all the information you need. We are not professional crisis workers. I am not a professional anything other than a professional idiot. Do not take my words as gospel, and very simply, don't be an asshole. And with that, let's get started. I'm really conflicted about this video. The topic is something I feel I have a moral obligation to talk about, but there are just so many uncertainties. For no other reason than that's just how the chips fell. But if I don't talk about it, at least one group or person is making a mistake that should land at least someone in jail. This is one of those stories where there are no good guys, everyone's a little shady, and everything has a kernel of truth hidden in a dumpster of confusion. Because in 2019, after spending over a decade of her young life in the public sphere, Carly Fleischmann suddenly disappeared from everyone's feet practically overnight under mysterious circumstances. And for the next five years, her fans, supporters, and autism advocates around the world have been speculating on her status. I'm going to present to you five scenarios of what could have possibly happened to Carly Fleischmann. And remember, every one of these have a little bit of truth but are not completely understood. I feel like I've opened a Pandora's box of shit. Everything about this feels like a conspiracy theory of some kind because there's just that little information about it available. But what information that are verifiable paints some very telling pictures that really should be brought to light. Scenario 1. The Assault on May 30th of 2018, Carly posted on Facebook about her friendship with television personality Kevin Frankish. There was a bit of a preamble about rocky family relationships. but it's family drama. Everyone has them and no one took them very seriously. Then on the 1st of February 2019, towards the end of the media cycle of the Me Too movement, Carly's account posted that her father's boyfriend had sexually assaulted her. Things got really real, real fast. In turn, her father denied the allegations and undermined her daughter's words. Disabled people are already at a higher risk of being sexual assault victims. Added on to the fact that SA victims are less likely to be believed, the fact that her father would take the sight of a partner over his daughter was, quite frankly, disgusting. Three days later, her account posted that she and her family were receiving death threats and have decided to go quiet. Then, two days later, her account posted that her social medias had been hacked and that none of the posts from the past nine months could be verified. This would also include the assault allegation and borderline the Kevin Frankish post. And with that, that's the end of what we publicly know about the sexual abuse allegation. It's at this point where the public started to bake. Did her father shut down her accounts to silence her? Was there really a hacker? Is the boyfriend still a danger to her? Reports were allegedly filed, police were allegedly called, nothing was made public, and four years later, we still don't know what happened. Because that was the last time we ever heard of anything from Carly Fleischmann. And that's scenario one. Carly was assaulted by a close family friend, and a father or a hacker proceeded to steal her voice to silence all accusations. And let's be painfully honest here. Even if all we had were those posts, it still paints a pretty damning picture. 
her father was, without a doubt, complicit in ignoring a sexual assault allegation on his daughter. Without knowing anything else, that's already feces level of bad. And that's one of the possible outcome of Carly Fleischman. Yet somehow, that's not the worst possibility. Scenario 2. The Exploitation Carly's father, Arthur Fleischmann, is the country manager of Canada for WPP, a company that, like a lot in its field, likes to use buzzwords to describe their job scope. But quite simply, they are an international advertising and marketing agency. Arthur is also the founder and CEO of John Street and Ogilvy Canada, two other ads and marketing agencies. And while it pains me to say that marketers and advertisers are legitimate jobs that deserves to exist and that it's fine to help your daughter in her work and passion, it becomes a little weird and exploitative when your company wins a bunch of recognition and awards from the other vouchers in the field, specifically for being the producer and designer of your daughter's show, never once mentioning that the agency is also run by the father. And it's especially weird that the name Arthur Fleischmann is so tied to the book Carly's voice that it becomes a search term more for looking up Arthur's marketing chops than for Carly. Again, none of this is conclusive of anything. It just feels really disgusting, like I've just stepped into a puddle of brown, and I'm not sure if it's chocolate or shit. To know that a father might be using her daughter's autism to boost his company's profile, especially when you notice how often his face pops up in early interviews. But you know, free market capitalism, whatever. The Fleischmanns can do whatever they want to earn their money as long as nobody gets hurt. Scenario 3. The Abuse Carly has gone through something called Applied Behavior Analysis, or ABA. It is an autism therapy where therapists attempt to treat an autistic person's behavior through repeated rewards and punishments for good and bad societal behaviors. If you have any brain cells, and I know my audience have at least two combined, you will recognize this as abuse. Autistic people who underwent ABA has a 2 to 5 times higher chance of being diagnosed with PTSD. And we know Carly has gone through ABA for at least 9 years. Please watch autistic content creator Paige Laley, who is far more well versed on the subject than I am, on why ABA is abuse. When Carly was 19, she was then subjected to electroconvulsive therapy, more commonly known as ECT. ECT is usually used as a last line treatment for major depressive disorder, mania, catatonia, psychosis, and many other severe mental illnesses. Illnesses. It is the last line of defense when everything else has failed, because despite all the progress throughout history, the side effects of running electricity through your brain can be pretty bad. I'm not saying ECT is evil, but it is known as a last line treatment for a reason. Its most common side effect is memory loss, and while undergoing it, you can absolutely lose your sense of self. In most places, you not only need to be able to give informed consent, but have the lasting powers of eternity handed over to someone. After her ECT, Carly lost her ability to type for a few months, but at least according to her father, she underwent the treatment with informed consent. And since she can type, her consent must be valid. Right? Scenario 4. The Neglect This is the part of the video where the earth opened up and swallowed me whole. I spent a little over 100 hours researching this. I have an above average knowledge of autism, not enough to be an expert or caretaker, just more than the general person on the streets. And after researching this video, I realized that's not a lot. So I want to talk about two things. The first being facilitated communications, or FC for short. FC is a speech technique that allows severely disabled non-verbal people to communicate. A facilitator will hold a disabled person's hand and point to a board of words or letters to communicate. FC is often used with autistic people under the idea that autistic people are just trapped in their bodies, affected by motor issues, and that we just give them a little push, help them a little, they'll be able to communicate. Basically like a Ouija board. Ouija board? Ouija. 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 And the reason why FC is a technique in air quotes is because it's trash. Psychology professor James Todd even called it the most scientifically discredited intervention in all of developmental disabilities. 
What a huge claim. There's even an entire website dedicated to dispelling its myth. Its successor, the Rapid Prompting Method or RPM is also similar. So I will be classifying them under the same FC phrase for this video. The moment you have a guide to guide someone to speak, that person is no longer speaking in their own voice. Their speech are, from that moment on, influenced by you. <laughs> uh, so I just finished taking the photo for my video's thumbnail and duct tape hurts. No shit, I know. I keep thinking back to this image of Carly where she had duct tape over her mouth. I keep wondering if she had given consent for it. About 8 years ago, I was working on like television and stage productions and stuff and I was working with props and one of the things I learned is that you know those shows where people have to duct tape their mouth for like police and stuff, uh, they don't actually always use real duct tape depending on what they want to do. Sometimes they just use fake duct tapes because the tape can rip off the makeup and sometimes leave a mark. I keep thinking back to that image of Carly with her tape over her mouth and does she know? Did she say yes to it? That does her parents know what they're doing? So the dangerous thing about FC is that sometimes the guy is actually speaking through the person and they can make the person say what they want the person to say and I don't know. It it keeps me up at night. FC has been used to sexually assault patients, accuse people of sexual assault, and gain fame through books about children who suddenly unlock their voices. If all those sound familiar to you, you're not alone. Once I found out about this, I jumped into a rabbit hole trying to find definitive video proof of Carly typing a whole text without outside prompting. The only video there was of her typing without a facilitator was relatively inconclusive. I couldn't prove or disprove if Kali could type. So I'm gonna give her the benefit of the doubt that she can indeed type while holding the knowledge of FC in the background. Let me be clear, I am not accusing Kali of committing a hoax. If she can type on her own, it's not a hoax, and if she can't, she's incapable of pulling off a hoax or giving consent. Either way, Kali is innocent here, but on the subject of consent, we will assume she can truly type independently without any guidance whatsoever, vocal or physical or otherwise. And if so, we need to talk about the second thing. Applied Behavior Analysis, also known as ABA. I've mentioned it briefly before, but it is a therapy method where psychological conditioning is used to train autistic children to change their social behavior. Historically, ABA has had more of a carrot and stick style of implementation. If you do something neurotypicals define as wrong, you get the stick. Beatings, scoldings, withholding aid, electric shocks, you know, normal stuff. Proponents of ABA have said that modern ABA doesn't do that anymore. It's all about the carrots now. Just do the right thing and you'll get rewards. We'll train you like dogs. It also doesn't help that autistic people form pattern recognitions differently. They can end up forming the mental roadmap that good things only come after suffering. People like that can end up looking for pain to find relief. And for this part, me and my surgical scars are speaking from personal experience. Can a person like this even give informed consent? We know Kali has undergone ABA. It has been stated by both her Facebook page and her parents in interviews. If she was looking for pain to get healed, can she even make an informed choice to get ECT? When asked, her father, her caretaker, even diverted the choice and responsibility to his disabled daughter, who at that time was barely an adult. Somebody has to make this chain of decisions make sense, because otherwise, it sounds like neglect. However, we are still not done because there's one last scenario to cover. Scenario 5, the mistake. Kali is actually fine. Nothing had actually happened or if it did, everyone who needed to know what happened knew. And we, the public, are just not one of them. She's with her loved ones and have chosen to stay out of the public's eye for her own now, which frankly, uh, I, I get it. She made all the decisions or proper caretakers did or the drama is over and she is safe, and that she is truly just recovering from a terrible relapse as we have experienced before. Or maybe just justifiably traumatized from my experience in the public's eye. 
being a public figure with mental illnesses can suck most of the time. There are secondhand accounts of her family's private social media posting about her, happily living her life. But none of those posts are accessible by the public as they should. In that case, I am the bad guy. I had just dragged an innocent woman in recovery into the spotlight. Told you, there's no good guy in this story. Not even me. Truth is, I didn't even want to investigate this. I was just checking up on what happened to Carly Fleischman because I remembered her from six years ago as an icon of giving neurodivergent people a voice and I wanted to share her experience with some people on social media. So I tried to look for any of her recent works. But the moment I stumbled back into her life story, I was trapped. I either stayed silent with my platform and let a possible case of abuse on a disabled woman go free or become complicit in spreading information that we don't have full understanding of. There were no good options. But in the end, I felt it was important to get these scenarios across, not to demonize anyone involved or stake a claim on the truth. Because honestly, it doesn't matter which of these scenarios are real. This story isn't even about Kali. Because Kali isn't the first. She isn't the only public autistic figure that have gone through these scenarios of hell. In researching this video, it seems that every single time a non-verbal autistic figure comes into the public light, their stories are depressingly similar. From David Mitchell and his autistic son's books, to Anna Stubblefield who assaulted a disabled man using FC to forge consent, and even Soma Mukhotpatye who uses RPM with a son Tito to garner media attention. This keeps happening. We keep trying to make autistic people into superhumans by putting them on a pedestal when they are able to communicate normally or do things neurotypicals deem good. But why do they have to communicate our way? Language is made up. For most of human existence, we didn't have words. Just because people can't speak doesn't make them less. We just have to do what we always do and listen and empathize, helping where we can. Kali isn't special because she can communicate by typing. She's special because she's Kali. It doesn't matter if she can speak or not because the people around her never seemed to listen to her voice. Her parents admitted that before learning she could type, they talked about her like she wasn't in the room. This is very common. Neurotypical society just don't seem to like hearing divergent voices. Do you want to know why I made this video? It's because of a simple social media post. Someone shared their dating app experience of talking to a match who used long form text. Eventually, this person asked the match if they could use short text instead. The conversation ended and they unmatched. That's fine. You're free to like who you want, how you want. Not everyone can gel. I get that. It's what happened next that got me. It's how the experience was phrased on social media in public. Did I just scare a recluse away by overwhelming them? Ha ha. Did you try to adopt an introvert without the permission? Ha ha. No, they just blocked me when I asked them to write in short text. Ha ha. They were writing their thesis. Ha ha. An introvert, a recluse, a nerd, an adopted pet. That was the type of language being used to talk about a human being who by their knowledge was either shy or neurodivergent. At no point did anyone say how brave that person was to have gone out of their comfort zone with their own voice. They were made fun of because their texting voice is different. Think about how much worse it must be for speech. For people like Kali who doesn't just text differently but talk differently. Okay. You know what? Let me demonstrate this for you. This is the remote for my teleprompter. I have something called bipolar disorder and anxiety disorder, a panic disorder, I'm sorry. And that means I constantly have racing thoughts. My brain moves faster than my body can catch up sometimes. It takes a while for me to create cohesive statements in my head. So when I'm with people, I have to speak fast. I have to pretend like I'm, whoa, what's that? I can say anything I want, blah, 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 blah. And I get tongue tied and misspeak and go blah, 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 and like, like, like. Oh. The thing is, that's not my voice. That's not who I am. That's a compromise I make. 
to communicate with people whenever I step out through those doors. This is me. This is me when I'm talking to myself. A slow cadence speech with pauses that lets me catch up to my thoughts. I have to pretend to be incoherent every time I step outside. I have to degrade myself and pretend that I am not able to form eloquent sentences. Because if I spoke this way, people get annoyed. Me talking to you through these videos using the teleprompter is me using a speech A. The teleprompter and the words I wrote beforehand are my way to collate my speech and communicate to them in a way that you won't find uncomfortable. It is a compromise I make for you. I cannot imagine how much worse this compromise must be for people like Carly. And I don't know what that person who matched on the dating app felt when they were told their compromise in speech was inconvenient. If I had been told that I couldn't use my preferred form of communication, that my chosen voice, this teleprompter, was some sort of shame or inconvenient to people, this video would be 4 hours long or only 8 words short. 8 words to tell you all that nuance and information I just regurgitated. 8 words to inform you of a past injustice. 8 words to convey the same summarized knowledge. 8 words to say. I don't know what happened to Carly Fleischman. <sighs> it's not over. So, that was legitimately where the video was supposed to end. At the time of writing the script and filming, I had as much information as I could get my hands on and I was happy with the direction of the video. It was a story that used Carly as a jumping off point to discuss the very serious and real issues of manipulation of voices in neurodivergent spaces. And as far as that was concerned, I am very happy with where I left off. That was the main message I wanted to get across with that part. But this video was supposed to be released two weeks ago. You know the rabbit hole that opened up in the main video? Turns out there's an even bigger rabbit hole underneath it. So consider this a part two. It has nothing much to do with Kali, so if that's what you're specifically here for, you can skip to this timestamp. As for the rest of you nerds, let's talk more about FC. As I research more into FC, I find myself drawn into this ongoing battle between proponents of FC and those who are skeptical of it. And by skeptical, I mean people who understand research in psychology. FC was once the name for a specific technique of hand-over-hand -hand communication, the Ouija board method I mentioned earlier. There are different forms, hand-over-hand, hand-over-elbow, under-wrist, over shoulder, macarena, etc. But over time, FC came to cover a multitude of methods that bear similar intrusions, like the rapid prompting method where a facilitator holds up a letterboard or keyboard, or even just renamed entirely, like spelling to communicate, typing to communicate, saved by typing or supported typing, and type my ass off, bitch. It's the same rebranding scam pyramid schemes slash MLM does. Same crap, different color. 
You might be wondering what this list is, scrolling down the side of the screen right now. These are all the research papers I've come across that shows FC and its related forms to have little to no reliability in its use. That's right, it is ridiculously discredited. In my 19 years as a writer, I learned one very important thing about communication. It's that it becomes less reliable the more barriers it must go through. For example, if I'm writing a novel, those words are going from me to the page then to the publisher. That's two barriers in which edits can be made, the page and then the publisher. If it then gets shared online, that's a third barrier where someone can interject with their opinions. Every single additional barrier can twist the original meaning by different amounts, like making spelling mistakes or having an editor change your words, for better or worse. Which is why if you want to know what an artist was thinking when they made a piece, you don't ask an armchair lecturer to give you some overt analysis, you ask the artist themselves. Words created through FC have to go through many barriers like the arm control or pre-preps, the board control, then to the thoughts of the facilitator, then a mental translation, and finally to the voice of the facilitator if a text-to-speech is not used. Before the sound even form from a non-verbal person, it has already gone through at least five wildly different barriers. A physical barrier, a technological barrier, a psychological barrier, a language barrier, and an oral barrier. Think of how often a person tends to misspeak when words are coming out of our own mouths. I've gaffed half a dozen times in this video alone on my own words and have to refilm entire section. And that's just two barriers I have to go through. Even if we were very over optimistic and say the failure rate of each barrier is a measly 1%, by the end of five barriers, 5% 5 of everything you say is wrong. That's one in 20 words. If any other method of communication had the failure rate of FC, we'll always fucking use it. I'm sorry, we'll never fucking use it. And there are some groups that support FC, like the Autism Self-Advocacy Networks, who used to have two FC users on their board of directors. They don't anymore. And that brings me to the second problem with FC. Because for some reason, every time a FC user becomes prominent enough or gets engaged with a legal matter that requires double-blind proof of their capabilities, they disappear. I wonder why. And throughout this two months while I made this video, I really struggled with whether I should put my thoughts on FC up like this. Even up to the last minute of making the first part of this video, I did not make a huge focus on FC. I'm not autistic, nor am I non-verbal. I don't have skin in this game. But that meant I saw this problem through neutral eyes. Every FC proponent I've seen in my research has been a practitioner, a caretaker, or a family member. These are people who have an emotional or financial incentive for FC and its derivatives to work. They need this to work. But if you look at the autistic people they purportedly speak for, they all seem to say the same thing, how they feel trapped in their body or there's a physical pain and even feeling like an alien in the world. But these are not what all autistic people feel, because everyone, even autistic people have different feelings. So the fact that they all match up should be a big red flag. You know that famous quote, once is happenstance, twice is coincidence, three times is enemy action, Gandalf by Stephen King. And it's been shown time and time again through double-blind trials, one of the highest standard of scientific trials the scientific methods have come up with, that when FC is used, it is the facilitators who are the authors of the autistic's work. Because people on the autistic spectrum are people, they experience and understand their autism in different ways from each other. They may have some overlapping ideas, but they shouldn't match one for one. The only way it will match every time is if allistic people are the ones who wrote it, the outsiders, the facilitators. Because regardless of what autistic people feel, the way they live are similar. The struggles they go through, the actions they need to do, the methods they use to cope, their feelings on these methods and events may be different, but the things they need to manage are the same. So we people on the outside looking in tend to form similar judgments. We outsiders, even caretakers, only see the visible challenges and thus will have preconceived notions based on neurotypical thinking. 
ideas like they look trapped when they are just thinking, that they look like they are in pain when they are just stimming, that they feel like aliens to us whenever we try to get to know what they are doing. Even I am guilty of that. It's what we want to hear. It's humanity's greatest superpower, the ability to twist someone else's thoughts in our own heads to fit our worldview. The reason I'm filming this part now is because while editing the previous segment on Kali, I stumbled across a video that perfectly encapsulated this idea. I'm about to show you Ariane Zocher and her daughter, Emma Zocher Long, who types using RPM, talking about the differences between what Emma says and what Emma writes. And I want you to see if you can point out what's wrong. Emma, you would say something and I would think that the words that were spoken were exactly what was meant. And also that the words spoken were indicative of what was being thought. And what I have learned through you, Emma, is that this is incorrect. And that the words spoken might be what was meant, but just as often and even more often they were not. So for instance, I might ask a yes or no question, um, and Emma, you might say typically yes, but in fact would mean no. What are you talking about, Ariane? When your daughter says yes, she doesn't mean no, she means yes. We can tell because that's what she says with her mouth. At the start, when Emma begins typing, you can hear her ask. She knows this is not how she converse. She knows this is work. She can 100% understand the patterns in language. She understand that when she makes that specific sound with her mouth, it means work in her brain. It's a sign that she understand the patterns of language, just not the nuance of linguistic, the same as all autistic people do growing up. And we know that because that's what she said with her mouth, with words that she's speaking perfectly finely. And Ariane understood her at that point because she could reply clearly and understandingly. That's effective communication without any pseudo-scientific method to make her seem more than she was. She just talked and you understood. You didn't need a freaking keyboard and screen. She's Stop treating her like a circus animal. She doesn't have to be the genius you make her out to be to be worthwhile. She's fine. She's just a 14 year old girl at the time, being dragged around by her mother across the country on speaking tours, made the poke at a keyboard, probably on muscle memory and image recognition, like some show. And do you know what happened when she came of age five years ago, when she likely had the ability to make her own decision or prove fraud, like Tino Mokopate, like Naoki Hikashida, like Amy Sequenza, like Ben McGunn, maybe even Carly Fleshman. She disappeared into obscurity. They all rose to the height of their advocacy career that many can only dream of with documentaries and talk shows and board positions and books. But when it truly mattered, when public scrutiny came or when choices starts becoming legally binding, they vanish. Like, remember when I was talking about ABA being abused and how it can be used to train people like dogs? Proponents of ABA have said that modern ABA doesn't do that anymore. It's all about the carrots now. Just do the right thing and you'll get rewards. We'll train you like dogs. I wasn't fucking around. When ABA and FC is used, it is such a violation of human right and personal autonomy. Like, you can use ABA to train someone into obedience and then use FC to forge consent. I cannot believe this is a freaking video I have to make. Like, Jesus Christ, this... 
The problem with FC is that instead of removing barriers, they increase it and it makes their integrity hard to verify. We can check things like sign language just by having someone else read the signs. Double checking is how we know a voice is authentic. Even Stephen Hawking, despite being fully paralyzed, had only two barriers in his speech. He used his cheeks to move his infrared glasses in order to select words on a screen. And we can confirm he is authentic because the software he used is open source and available to everyone. Unlike FC, where we would have to unrealistically check every single facilitator on earth for bias. It's like trying to disprove the existence of unicorn by showing that every horse in the world doesn't have horns. I've spent nearly 200 hours on this story and I can't even confirm Kali's capabilities of speech. And I get it. I really do. Parents of non-verbal autistic children can so desperately want their children to speak and that they would do anything to make it happen. That they are normal children trapped by physical issues rather than a person who have a neurodivergent mind. The proven method for people like Carly, like Emma, are augmentative and alternative communications or AACs and they may not work. But that's not a reason to find a false placebo. Maybe your child really is non-verbal or like Emma, have limited speech capabilities. Is that so bad? It's not their fault they are the way they are. And while it may be more practical for caretakers to advocate to turn autistic children normal with ABA and FC, it's definitely not more moral. Because you're forcing autistic people to mask, to pretend to be something they are not to satisfy societal norms. While reading Arthur Fleischmann's book, Carly's Voice, and holding on to the mindset of parents desperate to want FC to be real, I was struck by how often the parents wanted Carly to be normal. And don't get me wrong, Carly, or at least Carly's voice, also profess a yearning for normalcy. And I spent so much time wondering if Carly can actually type that I forgot that it doesn't matter. If she couldn't type, it's just another form the author used to present their wish for Carly to be normal. And if she could type, it's a failure on her parents who made her think her being herself wasn't good enough, that because of her difference, she was somehow missing out on some better parts of life. Completely missing out on the fact that she was normal to her. Autism is her normal. And the jobs as parents was just to raise her to be kind not to make her become someone else. One of my fondest childhood memories is staying in this hotel and there was this kid on the balcony of a building far opposite. We couldn't hear each other but we waved and danced like we knew each other our whole lives. Isn't that communication? We didn't need our parents to run telephone for us. People looked at us like we were weird and embarrassing ourselves. The only discomfort then came from the people who judged the diverse. But at that moment, I wasn't hurting anyone. And I was happy. And isn't that a good life? Hey everyone, thanks for watching. This is not where I want to end the video, but it's where I need to end the video because the story has just gotten way too big. This started as like a project that would take me like 50 hours and I am now 250 hours in. You know, usually when researching a video, you will open up leads that open up different branches and circle around back to something that you've covered before and when it circles around you close the loop and you know oh okay that that part's done and once all the loops are closed you know oh that's that's all the research that I can get. I'm still uncovering leads all the way now like while I was editing the part about Emma Zucha Long I found an entire new rabbit hole about verbal people claiming to be non-verbal so that they can advocate for FC and RPM 
And that became a whole thing because these people become like some of the biggest names in the movement. And I'm not H-bomb. I don't have a year to spend on a single story. I estimate that to complete this entire story properly, this video will have to be two to three hours. And I just don't have the resources to do that. Like even just Kali's story. I think I'm only 84% through it. I'm still putting in due diligence to find out what happened to Kali Fleischmann and I'm following some leads that are on stall but it's still not over and it's honestly just gotten too much for me I, I need to take a step back for my mental health like I found a lead on a possible ongoing abuse case and I might have to call the cops depending on how it works and I'm that's I'm a I'm an idiot on YouTube that's way out of my pay grade I don't get paid actually now that I think about it. But yeah, so that's this is gonna be where the video ends. Um I think I've said enough about ABA FC and ableist parenting that it should make some people think twice about any of those subjects. I personally think this combination is one of the greatest violations of human autonomy that I have ever seen in the 21st century. It's honestly quite atrocious. I will keep track of that possible abuse case, I will follow up on my leads with what happened to Carly, and I will read up more about autism just to broaden my own knowledge. Imagine that, learning stuff just because you want to learn, wow. I actually got really angry while making this video because like, Individual autonomy is one of the most important things to me and, and knowing that there is this popular movement of a combination of FCABA and ableist parenting that is constantly and regularly taking away autonomy from non-verbal and autistic people. Yeah, it's just a lot. But for this story, this video about FC, ABA, and ableist parenting. This is gonna have to be where it ends. But I'm waffling now, so um, Patreons. I love them. Like, share, comment, subscribe, YouTube things. Happy New Year! <laughs> I'll see you next time. Bye.